Let's talk about GATS. Just one trade agreement. I like to talk about GATS because it's the most local of all the global agreements. It covers those things that are traditionally regulated by states or provinces or services that are even provided by cities. So the global reach of trade agreements has come pretty much down to the grassroots level of government. There are negotiations going on in the GATS right now. I'd like to explain to you what the fight is about and what Congress might do about it. I'm talking about day in and day out oversight. Is Congress putting its eye on the ball here? And I'll try to persuade you that perhaps it isn't and it would be interesting and important for Congress to start overseeing the part of trade policy I call the democracy part. Um, the GATS, to spell it out, is the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And it does what you would expect a trade agreement to do. It's got rules like all the other agreements that prohibit discrimination against foreign service suppliers. Then it does things that other trade agreements don't do. It actually has limits on governing authority that have nothing to do with trade per se. In fact, the set of rules I'm about to explain to you only apply in the context where there's no discrimination. So we're talking about laws that regulate domestic fill in the blank, insurance companies, hospitals, banks, utilities. Without respect to whether or not there's any international trade, it's just a question of which company owns the utility or which company owns the insurance subsidiary. So rather I'm going to just focus on negotiations about so-called disciplines on domestic regulation. That's the real democracy issue. So what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> To my way of thinking, it's a democracy issue because of the kind of services that domestic governments regulate, and I'm talking really broad scale here, and the rules by which you make decisions in the Congress and in state legislatures and in regulatory agencies, the, the wheels that make democracy turn. So if I can persuade you that these GATS negotiations are going to affect broad service sectors that you care about deeply and that they are going to change the wheels of democracy, then I hope you'll understand that there's a crying need for congressional oversight and there's virtually none going on. <clears throat> so what's a service? You can't drop it on your foot. Uh, it's, it's not a good per se, but it is a trade and a good. Wholesale distribution is a service. The kinds of services that I think are most directly affected by the current negotiations are ones that Congress is either working on or hoping the states will work on. I was talking to Holly earlier, uh, state insurance reform in the health sector is a service which could be affected by these negotiations. How about coastal development, coastal permits for things like ports, desal facilities or liquid natural gas terminals, energy, almost any aspect of energy except perhaps the pulling it out of the ground but the processing, the transportation, the sale, the distribution of energy is covered, gambling, health facilities and the people that work in health facilities, doctors and nurses and other kinds of technicians. Um, prescription drug distribution, I could go on. You, you, you see my point? These are all services that are regulated by or provided by state governments and city governments. And where those services are so big in scale that they involve the national economy, we have something that the lawyers like to call dual sovereignty or dual regulation, where both the states and the federal government are regulating things like electricity and health insurance at the same time. So <clears throat> that's one reason why GATS negotiations on domestic regulation are a democracy issue. They're, these are the hot button domestic policy issues of our day. Now before I just launch into explaining four examples for you, and would you kick me when I have five minutes left? Just <laughs> give me a good sharp. Before I jump into just a few examples of what the trade rules, the so-called disciplines, the whips, what they look like, let me tell you a quick story that hopefully some of you will remember. It's about the Energy Policy Act of 2005. This is a, one of Congress's signature pieces of legislation. It was supposed to bring energy policy up to date and put America on a solid footing for greater energy independence, more environmentally sustainable energy, and yet opportunity to grow by bringing in more sources of energy. One, in, one source in particular was a favorite of Congress because it burns cleaner than oil, and that's natural gas. But our domestic ability to produce it is limited, so Congress is looking for ways to import the natural gas. And for the most part, that means on ships. So how do you carry gas on a ship? You freeze it. Liquefied natural gas is really cold and really volatile. And it comes in on ships, and so it has to be 
uh, offloaded from a ship in a port that has the capacity to warm up the gas, uh, essentially expand it, put it into tanks, and have all that happen without the thing blowing up and creating a mushroom cloud that would clear out 30 uh, diameters, 30 miles in diameter um, of countryside, including the people who live in it. So it's a technology that's controlled, but it's risky in the sense that you want to be really careful where you put it. And the rub is, when you have enough security to, to keep the mushroom cloud from exploding on one of these ports, that much security pretty much disrupts anything else that's happening whenever one of these ships is at dock. If you live in a port city and there's an LNG tanker coming in, the Coast Guard seals off the port and nothing moves for eight to 10 hours at least. So when cities like Portsmouth or Long Beach entertain the prospect of an LNG terminal, originally the cities were hopeful because like, wow, this is a major source of energy. We're gonna get a real rush of natural gas at affordable rates. And then they realized what, would it, what it was gonna do to their port, i.e. shut it down every time a tanker comes through. So it became one of the most controversial issues in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. And to make a long story short, the federal government pushed very hard to expand access to LNG through these ports. And then once that was in the bill, the states pushed back very hard. We're talking governors from all kinds of states, forget Democrat, Republican. Every governor in a state where there, one of the 45 permits was, was pending for one of these ports was very concerned about the security impacts as well as the potential environmental impact and the local commercial impact of these port facilities. The result was a compromise, a, a state of the art, if you will, of our federal system in which the federal government pushed for more energy and the states pushed back to preserve their traditional regulatory authority to decide where these ports would go based upon not the energy criteria, because that's the federal decision, but rather upon the coastal development criteria. Criteria such as preserving scenic vistas, if your local economy is keen on tourism, or preserving access to the to the coastline if your economy depends on fishing or small-scale commerce or recreation. Uh, how about historic values? A lot of California cities had historic districts that they didn't want to have blighted by a port being right next door. And then, of course, obviously the environmental, impa environmental impact on the estuaries or the coastlines. So why did I tell you this story? Because out of the 30-some-odd major proposals, disciplines on domestic regulation that are now being negotiated and coming close to the finish line, uh, the four most important, I think, would conflict with the way the United States Congress brokered the deal in the 2005 Energy Policy Act. So let's just go through four trade examples, and I'd be happy to sit down. <clears throat> um, actually, I'll start with one that didn't make it to the finish line. The most um, radical proposal advanced by Australia, Hong Kong, Switzerland, and seven or eight other countries was one that said domestic regulations must be necessary. This amounted to a requirement that governments before adopting a law had to prove that they were taking the least burdensome approach available. But what do legislatures do? They seek the middle burdensome <clears throat> approach. That's called compromise. And by definition, this trade discipline would have essentially said that compromise, the middle ground position, was a violation of the trade agreement. Well, you can see, that was obvious. The, the, it was so radical that even the United States government decided to oppose it and with support of Brazil, and a coalition of developing countries, that discipline is gone. So what's left? These, my rule of thumb is that the more innocuous a rule sounds, the more you should <laughs> assume that it's probably dangerous. Objectivity, <laughs> relevance, pre-establishment, and simplicity. Now what could be wrong with objectivity? Uh, the idea, of course, is that trade rules should be objective, but who's gonna decide what objective means? One definition of objective in US courts is rational. That is to say, it's not crazy, it's not arbitrary. It's, it's plausible, the courts aren't gonna second guess it. But if you look at WTO documents, we found five different versions of objectivity, one of which is not subjective. <laughs> so how does that relate to my example of the Energy Policy Act? <laughs> okay, California can deny a coastal permit of any kind, LNG port, a regular port, a desal facility, on grounds that it interferes with scenic vistas. What do you think a scenic vista is? I mean, it's, it's virtually an artistic term of regulation. It's by definition subjective, likewise historic preservation. And not only that, but these four criteria that I mentioned, they aren't just like serially think about them one at a time, it's a balance that the coastal commissions of all 25 coastal states get to make. So you kind of take into account <clears throat> 
the impact on the scenic vistas, with the impact on local commerce and access to the beach, with the impact on the environment. And what you're doing is, as a regulator, you're really coming up with a fact-based decision, often after long public hearings, all sorts of yelling and screaming and lots of local news articles, after long public hearings, you say, okay, in our best judgment, we think this is what the public interest is. But the public interest is actually the balance of all sorts of competing interests. If that's not subjective, what is? So, ladies and gentlemen, we have two big ideas here. You have the American regulatory state, which involves delegation of really complicated service industry decisions to regulatory agencies who balance competing interests to decide, based on facts and hearings and public input, what the public interest is. Versus another concept of regulation, which is that it can and should be objective. One, defini one definition of which is not subjective. 